a little bit about uh, wavelength and frequency and did she do any calculations or examples with anything like this? She, she said she would let me do that? No, she said she didn't think you were going to cover that. She didn't think I was going to cover that? Yeah. Oh, she's so like you, you looked out when you guys got Misha. Generally, the subs are not as um, proficient. She's taught that class before. She's taught that this class before at our college. So you guys looked out. And she's right. I don't do a lot of math with the wavelength and frequency. However, what I am going to ask you to know is the relationship between the two, right? If we're talking about wavelength versus frequency, it's related by a relatively famous equation. Anybody know the equation that relates wavelength and frequency? Equals MC squared has something to do with it, yeah. We'll get close. I, I only asked that because I remember something about Einstein who was like so fascinated with light. Right. Einstein said that um, light has what he called a duality in its nature, meaning, and this this goes back to our energy. I throw my little You gotta think about them like little packets of energy, like a jewel or a calorie. Um, but they all and they have this particle nature, but they also travel in waves. So it's sort of like if you took a garden hose. If you've ever been out in the yard or washing your car, you're trying to get the hose away from something, you kind of give it a little flick. You could see the wave go down the garden hose. Well, she brought a big sleep. Did she? That's the demo I generally use. I love Misha. She's awesome. generally in nanometers, what we talk about it in chemistry. Yeah. Astronomers like this angstrom idea. So we look at nanometers because it's the distance of linear length. So it's the distance between the crests of a wave. The amplitude is this part right here. If you have an amplifier or a volume control on your stereo, what happens is the wave will get larger, but it will still pass through the same area, so it'll still have the high part here, it'll still have the low part here, so it'll still have the same wavelength, but it, the peaks and the valleys will simply be higher. The um, bottom is often called the trough, the top is called the peak maybe? Yes. All right, if you have a whole bunch of waves versus a few waves, so say you are on the beach here, and the waves are coming in, right? This one, the frequency is higher. Right, so <coughs> what is frequency? I'm talking physics, physicists like to use frequency. Some, some event per unit of time, right? So some event per unit of time. And in this case, the frequency is the number of waves per second or waves per minute. So here the frequency is lower. So which one would it cost you, if you were just jiggling a garden hose, which one it, would it cost you more energy to input? <coughs> the higher frequency, you have to jiggle it a whole lot higher. So here it's higher energy, has to put in, and then this is lower energy. Would that be dependent on the amplitude as well? The amplitude, you know, that's a great question. If we had an oscilloscope, if, you're if we had an oscilloscope, we could try like that. Said, if you're going right. like this. We'd have to ask a physicist on that one. Um, but these are both related with this idea of C, which is energy, is related to wavelength times frequency. And there's some weird symbols that they use. This is basically the idea of energy. And this is wavelength. And this is the frequency. So it's an inversely proportional relationship. As the wavelength gets longer, the value for wavelength gets longer, what happens to the frequency? Uh, right, so if we have the wavelength is longer, so it's a bigger number, then the frequency goes down. Here, where the wavelength is shorter, right, so it's shorter, then the frequency goes up. So it's an inversely proportional relationship. Question? Uh, Okay, they might use V. Physicists is it v sometimes. Or is it like a Greek v? Sometimes the physicists 
step on our toes. I think Brown LeMay, your author may you see or be, it's, it's the relationship between the frequency and the wa wavelength. Um, electromagnetic radiation <coughs> is all the radiation coming from space. When the Big Bang event happened, all the energy started to move outwards from the universe. What we can see with the human eyes is a very narrow spectrum, and it goes along this idea of Roy G. Bit, red, orange, yellow, et cetera, et cetera. So these things that Einstein envisioned, these quanta of energy, are packets, but these packets travel in waves. And so we have to think about it in the duality, the dual nature of energy is what Einstein talked about. There we go, E equals HV, whereas H is Planck's constant. We're not gonna do those calculations, but it is a good one to understand if you're going into engineering, especially in electricity. There's the C one. What are these images from? Infrared. Infrared. So we can't see infrared with our eyes, but they do have cameras now that you can use to see infrared range. And what I always like to remember is infrared is a little bit past red color. So infrared is on the other side of it. So here's red. Infrared is over here. This side is the blue, which is on the opposite side of blue is ultraviolet. So if you think about it, it's Roy G. Biv in this direction, right? So red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet in this direction. Infrared we can't see, ultraviolet we can't see. What is? What do we know about ultraviolet radiation? It's from the sun. It's from the sun, and it comes through, and what keeps it from hitting us? The atmosphere. The ozone in the atmosphere, so that's actually a chemical reaction that the ozone goes through in the atmosphere to keep the infrared radiation out of us. Do you know the formula for what ozone is? Chemical formula? O3, which is ozone. Now ozone is interesting stuff. It is generated through the combustion of carbon-based fuels like fossil fuels down low here at the surface. Ozone at the surface is a respiratory irritant. It's bad for us to breathe. It is also used sometimes to kill mold and mildew. If you have a home, um, where there's a lot of mold and mildew in it, they will take and they will generate ozone on site in the home. They will completely encase the home. They will generate the ozone on site because it's actually a very fragile molecule. It easily breaks down. When ozone breaks down, what do you suppose it breaks down into? O2. O2, and what we call a free radical. Whoopsie, it's not O2. It's O with a 2 minus. This is called a free radical. Okay, the free radical doesn't last very long. What do you suppose that free radical does? Finds another free radical, right? And makes what? Another O2. So basically when ozone breaks down, you get multiple of these breaking up, making more O2. And what happens is it's because of the molecular geometry of the O3. Okay, there's a double bond here. And then there's a single bond right here. Ultraviolet radiation, because it is a very specific packet, so UV radiation, I put it as a packet, but it also has a very specific wavelength and frequency. Because it is this specific packet that has a wavelength and frequency, it's the perfect packet to break this bond. So you see what happens is the O3, which looks like this, that UV radiation breaks that single bond, and then what you get is an O2, and O2 is always double bonded. We, have we done molecular geometry in lab yet? Did you guys do that already? No. You haven't done that yet? All right, when you get to molecular geometry, you'll see O2 has a double bond in between it, and then this O is, is a free radical, which it then makes another one. So this idea of energy, and it's super important to us, back in the 70s, they invented aerosol spray cans. And do, do any of you remember the history? I mean, I was alive then, but most of y'all were not. So what happened with the aerosol spray cans? What were they doing? They were destroying the ozone, because what happens was those aerosol spray cans, the chemical reaction, it wasn't an energy reaction like this particular reaction with the UV radiation coming in. It was a chemical reaction that the um, aerosol that they used as the propellant out of the spray cans was going in and breaking that bond. And if you look back historically, they saw that this was true because the hole over the Antarctic was getting bigger, the hole in the ozone. And they were very concerned because a lot of UV radiation was coming down through that hole in the ozone, and it was causing a lot of skin cancer and a lot of other problems. And so once they outlawed the uh, propellant in the spray cans, the ozone hole started to repair itself. 
and that's what happens in the environment. Um, so we have to be very careful about what we do, we, and we can monitor these things, you know, global climate change. And it's not a question of whether you believe in it or not. It's a proven scientific fact. It's like, I don't believe in hats. Okay, well, hats exist, <laughs> right? So it's not a question of whether you believe in it or not. It's actually here. We've got to do stuff about it. All right. If you look at the different sources of light through, I think you guys do this in lab. Have you done the lab where you use the light with the lenses and you look at the different color lights? She brought it in. She brought it in. Did she? Oh, good. Did you look at the fluorescent light and at different yeah. lights? Yeah. Did you try to? It's hard. It's hard to look at those. But if you look at the different sources of light, depending on how the light is generated, the source will appear different. Now, all of there's different kinds of spectra. There's continuous spectra and there's bright line spectra. This is a continuous spectra here. You see all the colors. And then what you see in this particular slide, this is a bright line spectra. What happens in a bright line spectra is you take an isolated gas and you put it in a tube and you run electricity through it. And as you run electricity through it, what happens is the um, electrons jump. Let me show you what that actually looks like. All right. If we wanted to look at the Bohr model, and what's the Bohr model of the atom? Right, we got the nucleus here that has the protons and the neutrons in it. And then we got these energy levels. And what resides, what hangs out in these different energy levels? Electrons. Electrons, all right. So what happens when you take an isolated gas, say for example, neon. You all have seen neon lights, right? Yes. You all have seen neon lights? What they do is they take a gas like neon and they put it in a tube and they, they used to be called a cathode ray tube, and then they put an electrical current through the tube, where you have the cathode and the anode, and they send electricity through the tube. And what that electricity does is they send it in a very specific wavelength. It will hit one of these valence electrons, and that valence electron will absorb that photon of energy as it hits that electron. When it absorbs that photon of energy, what it does is it jumps up to a higher energy level just for a split second. And what you see then is what's called an absorption spectra. You will know, need to know the difference. These are in your textbook. Uh, the different types of spectra, you'll need to know what an absorption spectra looks like. You'll need to know what an emission spectra looks like. And you'll need to know what a continuous spectra looks like. So let's look. Photon doesn't take the place of the electron. The electron absorbs the energy that the photon contains. And it's a really specific packet. And we can tell how it absorbs because it'll go to a different energy level. All right, here's what they look like. All right, so this we'll talk about the prism idea later. Okay, so a continuous spectrum is the one that's at the top. If you look through a prism and you've seen a rainbow, that's what the rainbow is. It takes white light and it breaks it up into all different colors. If we look at fluorescent light, which is generated very much like a cathode ray tube, it has a gas in it, often some mercury gas in there. And they'll have a cathode and an anode, and it, as you see the, the fluorescent light goes through, it will send electricity through it and it excites the electrons. The electrons absorb that photon of energy and what they do is they create this. If you looked at the spectra of the light as it absorbing these photons of energy, you see what's called an absorption spectra. And the black lines, where they are absorbed, tells you the quanta of energy that that particular electron was able to grab. All right? So you've got all wavelengths of energy in a continuous spectra. You zap an isolated gas with energy, and it will absorb energy at certain very specific wavelengths. And astronomers have used this. They put the filter over the telescope, and they look at a star, and they can tell what kind of gas, if there's water on a planet. They knew there was water on Mars prior to actually going there and sampling the rocks, because they could use this idea of an absorption spectra as they pointed it at the gases in Mars. Then the opposite is true with the emission spectra. 
once the electron has absorbed the energy that the photon gave it, it will instantly jump up to a higher energy level just for a split second in time. That's when it creates the absorption spectra with the black lines. Then it will release that energy. So energy is then released. Once it releases that energy and it goes back down to its original shell, then what you see is the emission spectra. And the emission spectra looks a little bit like the absorption spectra. Sometimes, sometimes it can look totally different. So this was the absorption spectra when it grabbed the energy from the wavelengths, and then this is how it re-emitted it if it re-emitted it at the exact same wavelength. Sometimes it does not re-emit it at the exact same wavelength. It's like I said, okay, remember energy is like money. If you gave me a quarter and I gave you two dimes and a nickel, wouldn't that be the same amount of money? Right? Okay, so sometimes when an electron absorbs energy, it'll absorb it in the 25 cents range, and then it'll give it back to the universe as two dimes and a nickel. So you can tell what atoms are and what their identity is based on this idea of comparing the absorption versus the emission spectra. And this is where astronomers have used this kind of thing to figure out what kind of things are on stars. So this is where the light source, it's white light, it's showing you here. White light would create a continuous spectra. If you have a hot gas, like in a star, or a cathode ray tube where you're sending electricity through it, or a fluorescent light, right? It's going to create an emission spectra, and if it's a cool gas, it can also create an absorption spectra. Once again, absorption spectra is created when they absorb the energy, emission spectra is created when it releases that energy. So the, the um, what is it, absorption and emission, those kind of, they, they go together as They one don't process. always match. They don't always match. In that slide, it looked like they always match, but I don't want you to think that that's the truth. But I mean, you're, you're not going to have one without the other. It's going to be part of one process. Yes, and you can match the two to figure out what the element is. Absorb and then emit. When exactly. It's absorb when it's yep. jumps up. And, then and it depends on the electron, where that electron is. And it absorbs something, and sometimes it will go just to the next energy level. Sometimes it will go two or three higher. And then, it, then when it drops back down to the original, it may drop down a little bit first and then again. And that's when it releases it as two dimes and a nickel versus absorbing it as a quarter. But it's one process. You're not going to just have an emission. And it happens like in less than a second. You're not going to have like an emission spectrum and no absorption spectrum. No, you have to have it. You have to have it. Yes. Yeah. 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 Yes. Absorption is when the electrons are grabbed. That's a good question because, for example, if I was looking at the energy requirement to go from, say, we'll say this is n equals 1, n equals 2, n equals 3, and these are what we call the principal. Oh, the camera, huh? Thank you. Thank you for reminding me. I forget what I'm doing here. All right. So if we're looking at the Bohr model again, well, we've got the nucleus with the positive and the negatives. 
We can say that energy levels are n equals 1, n equals 2, and n equals 3. This idea of n is what we call the principal quantum number. And that value corresponds to the row on the periodic table. All right? So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, or 7 is the principal quantum number, that value right there. So the maximum value that the principal quantum number is can be 7. So the max number of shells any atom can have is 7 energy levels or 7 shells. What you need to know is that n equals 1 to n equals 2, that jump is not as large as n equals 1 to n equals 3 which would be a different energy requirement. So there is some information in the text about those issues. So when you grab the energy and you move up from n equals 1 to 2 or 3 or 4 or so on, there's a packet of energy that's absorbed, and then when you release it. So the larger the number is, the larger the packet of energy that's absorbed. And the larger the packet of energy that's absorbed relates to the frequency and wavelength, right? Higher energy, lower energy. Yes? So is the continuous spectrum then that comes like the emission the and of, the sum of emission? No, no, no. The continuous spectra is all of the energy created and broken up by a prism of some sort of source of white light, whether it's fluorescent or halogen or candlelight or LED or whatever the source of white light is, is going to create a continuous spectrum which has all the colors in it. The absorption spectra you can start with a continuous spectrum, but you're going to take some hunks out of the continuous spectrum that you're going to have as black lines. The emission spectra is going to look all black, but all that's going to be there is little lines of energy where the electron released it, whether it released it as a quarter or whether it released it as two times. Right. Like you said, the uh, emission and uh, absorption may not always match They up may not. In, in the slide, it looks like they do. So if you were to put the two together, it's not going to always It's be not going to always match up. Sometimes they do. But most of the time, I would bet they probably don't. Uh, can you give an example of like how these would work? In everyday life? Well, astronomers love this stuff. We uh, can use this idea in a machine called an atomic absorption mass spectrophotometer. How's that for a cocktail party discussion, right? <laughs> an atomic absorption mass spectrophotometer. And in an atomic absorption mass spectrophotometer, what they do is they take a sample of something that you want to identify, like in forensics, perfect example. And they gather something, some fluid or something that they want to identify in forensics, and they send it through this machine, and it will gasify the sample to create gaseous atoms. And then they zap it with different kinds of energy to see what it absorbs and emits. And then they look at the absorption and emission spectrum, and they go, oh, well, that was iron from blood. Or, oh, that was iron from a bullet. So they can tell the difference in them based on this analysis. I'm going to post a video that will explain a lot of this. We're not going to be able to have time to finish chapter six. It's a lot of theoretical stuff. I'll post a video along with the homework assignment. Make sure you look at the video. Make sure you read chapter chapter six, seven, eight, and nine are chapters you absolutely must read because we do not have time to go over all this stuff in class. Right? You absolutely must read the next four chapters, six, seven, eight, and nine. I'll post that tonight.